And I've done so many things in my career, from uh, being a maintenance officer to flying, uh, and how many of us can say that they actually have been at the South Pole. When I uh, went to college at the University of Buffalo, I got involved in the Air Force ROTC program. Uh, when I went there, everybody had to do either ROTC, gym, or play in the band. And I had been an adequate trombone player. I wasn't interested in being in phys ed, and so I figured, well, I'll try this ROTC thing. You know an Air Force ROTC scholarship offers you more than a tuition-free education and free flying lessons. Take them up on it, and you'll find yourself as an officer on America's aerospace team. And once I got involved in the ROTC program, I really just changed my whole attitude about everything that I wanted to do and decided to make the Air Force uh, something that I would go into. Uh, it seemed like an adventure. It seemed like it was going to be a lot of fun. It was during the uh, Vietnam era, and at the University of Buffalo, we were attacked by the Students for a Democratic Society. Uh, I was actually uh, had stones thrown at me, paint thrown at me. And uh, being a, a rather American-focused kind of guy, I was just violated by all of that and, uh, and thought that it was important for people to defend our country. Uh, once I got into the Air Force, my intent initially was to spend four years. I had gotten married while I was in college. And uh, Sue and I uh, went from uh, uh, Buffalo, New York to, uh, to uh, Syracuse for a few months. And then it was off to uh, Chanute Air Force Base to do uh, training for, for maintenance officer school. Uh, we got to Chanute and uh, we had an incredible a good time. I uh, went from there to Norton Air Force Base in California as a maintenance officer. And then one of my clever lieutenant friends uh, suggested that uh, a way to not have to go to Vietnam right away was to volunteer for an accompanied assignment to Thailand, which I did. And while I was there, my boss uh, said, you know, you ought to get into flying. And I said, well, I have an eyesight issue. And he said, well, you know, go to nav training. So I applied for navigator school. And uh, when I was taking the physical, the doctor asked me where I was going to pilot training. And I said, pilot training, I'm not qualified. And he says, uh, yes, you are. And uh, the long and the short of it is I turned in an application for pilot training, ended up at uh, Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, from there, I went to 141s, and there began my career uh, in the Air Force and in aviation. Um, and so I got most of my hours in the C-141. But then I was fortunate enough after a couple of assignments to end up at Altus Air Force Base as a vice commander there and got to fly both the 141 and the C-5. And then later in my career, uh, I went to become the, uh, the uh, Director of Operations for Air Education and Training Command, where I got to fly every airplane in Air Education and Training Command. So helicopters, fighters, a uh, little of everything, as long as I was with an instructor. So when I retired, I had actually flown 27 different airplanes and logged time in those airplanes. So in 1988, uh, after I had gone to the National War College, I was assigned uh, to the joint staff as the, the GOMO, the General Flag Officer Matters uh, Director working for the Director of the Joint Staff. And our job, uh, an office of four, was to coordinate all of the assignments uh, of the three and four stars, uh, to coordinate promotion board results, uh, through the uh, joint staff, through the services, up through the Congress and to the President of the United States for signature. I got an assignment to go to what I really, an assignment that I'd always wanted to go to was the, the J-34, Director of Ops and Logistics at uh, Transcom, United States Transportation Command at Scott Air Force Base. And I arrived there uh, in uh, July and, uh, and got into the job. Uh, decided that we needed to have better integration between some of our customers, made a trip uh, with Defense Logistics uh, Command uh, Agency uh, out to California, and uh, we were out there on the 10th of September, and uh, went to bed that night uh, after being out on the flight line and working with some of the young kids, woke up the next morning to airplanes flying into the World Trade Center. My wife was back in Illinois, and, uh, and I called her before I was going to go to breakfast with some of the airmen at uh, Travis Air Force Base. She said an airplane has just hit the World Trade Center. So I turned the TV on and I thought it was a Cessna or you know, some young group out there just made a mistake. And I watched as the second airplane hit. Then all of us that had any understanding of what terrorism is about knew that we were under attack as a nation. And I can remember saying to my wife, I, I just hope everybody in Washington, D.C. is safe. Uh, and by the time uh, we went to breakfast, you know, we had the, second, the airplane that crashed into the Pentagon. Uh, and when we were 
at the location for the breakfast is when the World Trade Center buildings collapsed, and that was the, that was the end of our visit. Uh, we then went back and started getting on secure phones and talking back to the headquarters uh, to establish a, a, a command center attitude about what was going to happen to put people on alert, to be ready to respond. I actually flew back that day when all the other planes were grounded. Uh, a strange, eerie sensation to be in the air that day. Uh, and uh, for the next two years, uh, very little sleep and an awful lot of energy spent in uh, directing the entire uh, effort uh, to move our troops. If there was a truck, train, bus, shipper plane that moved anywhere in the world with the military that was directed by my staff, uh, very proud uh, of not only, it's exciting to be thrown into that, but I'm very proud of the group of people that worked for me. Uh, they were incredible. Uh, it was a team effort uh, and uh, there was no one person uh, that should take any credit for that, but there's about uh, 75 uh, to 100 people from around the world in different organizations that really made all that work. Uh, one of our missions was to support the uh, National Science Foundation at the South Pole, and I was fortunate enough to go down uh, on a trip. I actually uh, tell people that I've actually walked around the Earth five times and run around it three, because you put your hand on the pole and you just do that. So kind of a Forrest Gump story, but uh, it was a phenomenal experience. Uh, we really did enhance the mission uh, to the South Pole, and in fact, the National Science Foundation, when I retired, uh, provided me a certificate, and there's actually a mountain in Antarctica named after me, believe it or not. Check it out, Mount Welser. Yeah, I had been the uh, J-34 at the uh, United States Transportation Command, and I was walking uh, between buildings one day, and, and a young man uh, who was the exec for our four-star said, hey, Bill, the general wants to see you. And, you know, we had had, a, a, it seemed like every day there was some direction coming from Washington, D.C. about what we were supposed to do next or who we hadn't supported or somebody that thought they needed better support or, or somebody that was very happy about the support they got. And so I went in to see my boss and uh, General Handy uh, said, uh, hey, congratulations. Uh, I said, sir, and he said, uh, you've been selected as the, the next 18th Air Force commander. Well, 18th Air Force didn't exist. It was a new, it was a combination of two numbered air forces into a, a new numbered air force and responsible for all of the wings and all of the organizations and the people and the airplanes uh, within uh, Air Mobility Command. And, uh, and came with that, it was a promotion to, to three star. Uh, and so we did that for the last two years I was in the Air Force. We were the office that was responsible for making sure that we supplied trained people and, and the, the equipment associated with them to the war fight. As I had learned in my job on the Joint Staff, uh, three and four star jobs uh, are based on a position. And so uh, when that position uh, goes away or your time is up in that position, if there's not another job for you at that time, then you retire. And that was the case for me. I, I, was, uh, I finished up that tour as the 18th Air Force Commander uh, and uh, there weren't any other jobs for me. I had 34 and a half years in the Air Force and I proudly retired. In 2011, uh, I got involved in uh, Honor Flight. Uh, I went out as a guardian uh, uh, in June of 2011. Uh, came back from that trip and said, could you use any help? <laughs> and in September, I was the president of Space Coast Honor Flight. Uh, and I just completed that uh, after eight years of uh, being the president of the board. Uh, did 52 trips to Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been recently elected to the National Board for Honor Flight, and I'm very proud uh, of both of those accomplishments. I think it's important because many of the veterans that go on the Honor Flights with us tell us that it is the best thing they've ever done in their life. We, had a, uh, we were getting off the bus at the uh, Iwo Jima Memorial, and there were 56 of us. And there were about four buses of school kids that had gotten off there also. And all of a sudden, just spontaneously, they formed a cordon all the way from the bus to the Iwo Jima Memorial. And as these veterans went to see, these kids are clapping. So here's kids that uh, are somewhere between 12 and 16 years old, clapping for these veterans who were at war when they were 16 to 18 years old. And so, you know, the program brings back uh, so much emotion and so much memory. Some of it good, some of it bad. Many of them lost friends. 
but it is an opportunity, as one vet told me, is, is kneeling down. In fact, it's on the cover of our brochure. Robbie Robbins, I, he went down to his knee, and I said, Robbie, you okay? And he said, I'm just thanking those that didn't come back. They are the real heroes, Bill, the ones that didn't come back. You know, veterans uh, sacrifice an awful lot. Um, there is very little payback. Uh, in 16.1 million veterans went to war in World War II. Uh, there's only about 600,000 of them alive today. When they came back, uh, they got married, uh, they went to school, uh, they got jobs, they rebuilt the world. And Korea is kind of the unknown war. Uh, you know, there were 5.7 million that went to war in Korea. There's very little thank you when they came back from that war. Uh, Vietnam, 8.7 million served in Vietnam. Uh, when I was in that time frame, we, when I got back from Thailand, uh, they threw rocks at the bus I was on. That was our welcome home. Uh, baby killer, we were called. And you think it's because people that defended our country, that put their lives on the line for this country, received very little thanks in the past. And all of a sudden, something 70 plus years or you know, whatever battle you were in or whatever conflict or, or campaign you were in, now here's people coming back and taking you to Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, where people spontaneously are applauding, thanking them for their service. Uh, and it it's really is paying back. It's paying back to those that uh, were in the service before and some in the service same time I was uh, and for what they did for this country. I think that our country uh, needs to always have a strong military and people that are willing to serve. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that we've had several presidents in a row that, that haven't had military service. We have many in the Congress, and I was very pleased during this last election that we had many people that had served that were elected. Uh, we have senior people in our government today that would, would not allow their children to serve today. And I think that if you look back several generations, uh, people that were very proud to have their kids. All four of my children went to the United States Air Force. I'm very proud of that. And uh, I think it's important that we have very smart, uh, uh, all races and creeds and uh, diversity in our military because it is a reflection of, of us. But at the same time, if we don't have that kind of individual that's willing to put their life on the line, we will not be the free country in the future that we are today.